So good morning, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to take a look at the second lecture, but already you should be thinking about the first test, which is open on Monday, September 18th. So not on a class day, but on the Monday. So coming up soon, take it on uh, Canvas. Uh, I will upload a practice test so you can take a look at what the questions uh, will look like on the Canvas page. As I say on the uh, syllabus, make sure to study the uh, lectures and the PowerPoint slides to take the test. There will be multiple choice questions. Um, you don't need to study the book in order to take the test because the questions are taken from uh, the lectures and the PowerPoints. So be thinking about that. So in um, today's class, we're going to proceed um, to the second uh, kind of big picture uh, lecture here. Where we're going to look at global paradigms and introduce the narrative of British history. Looking at the two major paradigm shifts that have occurred in recorded European cultural history from the 300s AD or CE to the present um, day and a condensed narrative of early recorded history in Britain from the Celtic period to the Norman uh, conquest, which takes us from 600 BC to 1066 AD. And um, well, part of that will spill over into uh, next, uh, next time. But as I mentioned, insofar as uh, Britain is our case study, look at the cultural history of that country. we we'll begin there because that's where recorded history actually started in uh, Britain. Not the native inhabitants recording their own history, but other people writing about them. Uh, so that's why we start there. But first, before then, We'll take a look at uh, two major paradigm shifts in Europe, and um, this is really a way to uh, frame European uh, cultural history from basically the um, period of the early, as I say there, 300s AD, so we're talking almost the last 1500 to 2000 years, to frame that history according to large scale paradigms or, or frameworks. A couple of things to think about, identifying paradigms, the intellectual paradigm, the transition from Judeo-Christian religion to science, and the material paradigm, the transition from feudalism to capitalism. I'm sure there are other paradigms we could think about, other frameworks we could think about, but here's just a way of keeping things kind of broad and manageable for the class, intellectual and uh, material. Suffice to say, they uh, coexisted with one another. So, paradigms, what exactly uh, does that mean? I would say a paradigm is a system of beliefs, values, ideas, and practice that guide how we see the world and or how we interact uh, with it. And when you put it that way, I think it's safe to say that we all have our own particular paradigms. It's kind of a lens that we're using to take in what we're perceiving. It would be nice to think that we take things at face value as they truly exist. We all know that that's not necessarily the case, that we're framing things continuously according to a set of, yes, beliefs, values, ideas, and also practices at the same time. They exist on a global, national, and individual level, and many other uh, levels in between. As I mentioned, individual people probably have their own frameworks, their own belief and value systems that they use to conceptualize things. But I think it's safe to say that um, nations also have their own uh, paradigms, their own kind of cultural uh, frameworks. And we're going to consider how they can extend to a continental level and even perhaps to a global level as well. They encompass the entire uh, planet or all of humanity, at least up to a point. And there I say the kind of differences between the two of them, the intellectual or mental paradigm and the material or economic uh, paradigm. That's the kind of way of breaking it um, down into these two camps. One that deals with the way we think about things or the way we see things. The material paradigm deals more with the kind of nuts and bolts, the kind of concrete way we act on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So that's the reason for that uh, division. The intellectual paradigm, uh, beginning with that, there are a lot of different ways we could think about an intellectual paradigm, but I think we could say that a lot of intellectual paradigms um, work from the basis of answering the following two questions. Where have we come from and uh, where are we going? 
And I think you could say that um, an individual nation usually has its own uh, particular version of answering those uh, two questions. And I think when you talk about um, national history, the question of where a people have come from, where a nation has come from, it can be based on facts and information, but it's usually caught up with mythology as well. The history of a nation tends to become quite a mythologized and even idealized things because it's a good way to stir up people's emotions and make them feel connected to their ancestors. So you take British history, for instance, well, there's an entire um, set of facts we could refer to when we talk about the origins of Britain as a nation, but there's a mythology as well, which centers around figures like King Arthur, for instance, and even reaches the level of uh, wizardry and sorcery and, and stuff like that, and becomes this story about a boy pulling, pulling a sword from the stone. Well, there actually was a historical King Arthur in British history, a Celtic king, but his story has just become wrapped up in all these layers of mythology. And so too, I would say, with just about every country. Even the United States, America, which is a young country, relatively speaking, it has its own set of mythologies pertaining to people like George Washington or Paul Revere or whoever you want to mention. The facts of the case have long since been buried under these kind of mytho mytho mythologized narratives. And where are we going in uh, the future? The paradigm, you could say, is a sort of um, predictor of where we're going or developing. And of course, it's imperfect because one of the lessons from history, which we can apply so many times to so many cases, is that we cannot see the future. We don't know exactly where we're going, but frameworks like to tell us where we're going. They like to anticipate things in the future. Now, speaking of paradigms that reach a kind of continental level or a global level, well, let's take a look at the uh, medieval period, for instance, and uh, Europe. When you look at Europe as a whole, you'd have to say that as far as intellectual uh, paradigms go, a religious paradigm, specifically the Judeo-Christian framework, prevailed in Europe as the predominant way of seeing the world. So insofar as the people at that time had an overarching framework, a kind of larger lens that they used to filter reality, well, they were seeing it through the context of the Judeo-Christian religious framework. And as we know, that framework answers those two questions basically has its own explanations. Where have we come from? Well, the Christian framework, the Bible tells us where humanity has come from, gives us an explanation for the origins, not just of a nation, not just of a people, but for humanity as a whole. Most religious paradigms aspire to that level of basically explaining the entire birth of humanity, story of the Garden of Eden, basically explains how we lived in a paradise in the past, then we made a mistake, and our lives are terrible, right? That's basically the narrative about it. And so too, Christianity and the Judeo-Christian framework as a whole gives us a uh, story about where we're going in the future as well. Speaks about the second coming, final judgment, stuff like that. So you look at that paradigm, it gives us a, an entire trajectory, a complete arc of the history of humanity, basically explains things uh, to us. How factual it is, of course, is another question. So that was the prevailing framework, still exists to this day, still very prominent within our culture and society. But you'd have to say that right around the uh, 1500s, a major transition began to occur in Europe that we're still living through today. When we talk about shifts in intellectual paradigms that are this large and this broad, then we're talking about things that happen over the course of centuries. We're still in the midst of this paradigm shift. It was a transition from a religious to a scientific paradigm. And we're still living in the kind of shadow of that to this day. I would say that broadly speaking, the scientific paradigm However we conceive it has become the main kind of filter, the way we view the world, the way we explain things to ourselves today, including things like the origins of humanity, as I discussed in the previous lecture, as well as all sorts of other things that we would care to uh, mention. The final point, the foundations of modern Western civilization grew out of the Enlightenment, which started in the early uh, 1700s. The Enlightenment was really where this shift to a scientific paradigm began to pick up uh, steam because the Enlightenment was really a uh, valorization of scientific thinking and scientific principles, as you might expect, an incomplete fractured process. It's not as though religion has disappeared. 
It's not as though Christianity plays no part in culture. So they coexist to an extent, but there's been nonetheless this uh, larger transition. As one might expect, there is a considerable challenge involved in changing intellectual paradigms. Even if people aspire to do so, which is not always the case, they're not the kinds of things that we change overnight or uh, easily. And here are just a few of the reasons for that. I'm sure we could think of many other reasons as to why this is the case, but here are just a couple that I can think of. First of all, social institutions are typically invested in preserving them. They become locked into their own particular uh, viewpoints and into their own particular agendas as well. You take, for instance, the Roman Catholic Church, which was by far the most powerful centralized institution in medieval Europe. The Catholic Church as a whole is invested in the religious paradigm. It upholds the ideas of that paradigm. And institutions as a whole, the more powerful they become, the more the wealthier they become, the more rigid they become. They become kind of ossified in the way they conduct things and in the way they see things. They don't want to change. And that, I would say, is true to this day. Catholic Church has kind of modernized itself, has embraced scientific thinking, you could say, to an extent, but nonetheless is still preserved, is still uh, maintaining this Judeo-Christian uh, perspective on things, not the least because there'd be no reason for them to exist if they didn't, right? So they have to kind of maintain that, that point of view that's the kind of core of their belief system, even if they've changed in other ways. Second point, and this is just a kind of subjective anecdotal point, right? People like to believe what they believe. It's hard to change people's minds about things. It's difficult to convince someone about something basic in their own lives, right? That they should break off that toxic relationship, right? Never tried to do that. You know it can be difficult to shake someone out of this kind of set of beliefs and ideas that they have. Now, think about that when it's on the level of their most personal and intimate beliefs and convictions about the way the world is or where humanity has come from or what happens after we die. You're generally not going to talk some or someone around just in the space of a day or something like that. I mean, yes, people do change, but it's usually a long, painstaking process. And as people get older, they become kind of more rigid in their beliefs and views. They don't want to change, necessarily. And that's why when you talk about something like an inter intellectual paradigm shifting, it's usually an intergenerational process. You're talking about um, grandparents, parents, children, that's where you see the gradual shifts over time. It has to extend across different generations just because of the way uh, people are, our, our kind of um, habitual ways of thinking about things. And the final point, and as far as the intellectual paradigm goes when it's on a kind of continental level or a global level, this is perhaps the most important point. There are many things that we don't know and perhaps uh, cannot know. And this is pertinent to debates about religion and uh, science. The transition to a scientific paradigm is, uh, has been based uh, to a high degree on evidence. But science doesn't tell us everything. It gives us speculative ideas and uh, theories. Um, but nonetheless, there are always inevitably going to be many gaps. For instance, I brought this up uh, previously. Science gives its own um, origins story. It's not the Garden of Eden story, but rather it's a story about how the universe began 13.8 billion years ago, according to the Big Bang Theory. So there you have an origins story. But science cannot tell us why this Big Bang occurred. It has no explanation for that. Why did the universe begin at a particular moment in time? No idea, because they have an incomplete text that they're working with. Thus, they don't see the totality of existence. We don't see all of existence, never will, because there are these barriers to it. So too, we'll talk about this later when we get to um, the lecture on science. Science can tell us a lot about the way organisms form, how planets form, why stars form, but there are a lot of things that it cannot explain about the basic fundamental forces, elementary particles. Why does this stuff even exist, right? Isn't that the kind of question we ask ourselves? Why is there existence instead of nothing? Science doesn't really have an answer 
that question. It doesn't know. So there are those kinds of inevitable gaps. And so too, when we just talk about on the personal level, things like mortality and the afterlife, we don't know what happens to people after they die. I mean, we like to pretend that we do based on faith or scientific evidence, but no one returns from that country. So we don't actually have a definitive answer to that question. So insofar as that's the case, insofar as it's difficult to change intellectual paradigms, we might uh, reasonably broach the question of how could they ever change, right? Because they just seem very kind of set in their ways. Well, first things first, it's not really the case that the religious authorities or any authorities whatsoever decided at a certain point they wanted to approach things in a different way. That very rarely ever happens. When you talk about the authorities, institutions, the wealthy, powerful people, as I mentioned previously, generally they don't want things to change. They like the status quo just fine. So that wasn't the reason. Rather, it was the slow, gradual accretion of evidence over time, evidence that conflicted with the prevailing religious paradigm. And this was scientific evidence and more specifically empirical evidence, just stuff that you can observe through your senses. That's basically what empirical evidence means. You can verify something by saying, yes, I'm looking at it right now, and you can verify that it's there or running tests and experiments that other people can run and repeat. That's what I mean when I say the accumulation of evidence over time. There's one of the people who was involved in this, uh, Copernicus, and there were many others as well. And that's partly why the advent of uh, science has been labeled the Copernican Revolution, because he was one uh, figure who was um, at the center of this uh, transition. He was someone who was involved in astronomy, came up with new ideas about astronomy. Here we get to these kind of big picture questions about um, not just what humanity is doing in our relationship to our environment, but indeed the wider cosmos, the structure of the universe. I mean, this is what this was touching upon. There you see Ptolemy's geocentric model of the universe. Geocentric means that it is a model of the universe that places the Earth at the center of the universe. This was a paradigm, a framework that persisted forever. I mean, we're talking 1,500 years, essentially. It still survived for some time after that. And it was a, a classical model developed by this figure of Ptolemy who was involved in all sorts of different things, but this was one of his uh, proposed model. Essentially says the Earth is the center of the universe, the center of existence. There you see uh, some of the uh, planets that we're already familiar with um, at the time, rotating around uh, the Earth, revolving around the Earth, and then you have the stars as well, and the sun uh, too. Note that even going back into the distant past, they were aware of the planets. They were aware, for instance, that Jupiter and Saturn, for instance, are distinct from stars. They could see that just by observing their orbital pattern. So they're not thinking of these as the same thing as stars. So there is that distinction already in mind. But on the other hand, they're working from the basis of the Earth being the center. The Ptolemaic model, the geocentric model, did uh, mesh with the uh, religious framework as it existed in Europe. It meshes with the Judeo-Christian uh, model for a couple of reasons. Uh, well, probably more than just a couple of reasons, but here are a few of the bigger reasons. Uh, for one thing, this model really works on the basis that the Earth is just fundamentally different from everything that stands out there. And that is really a kind of logical uh, conclusion to arrive at uh, at the time, but it is also, you could say, a kind of religious conclusion as well. The earth is the seat of earthly life, and it is its own particular thing where we're kind of caught up in the sort of the, the, the dirt and the rocks and just the flux and the change of regular haphazard existence. All of that stuff just happens down here on the surface, and then standing above us is a more ethereal and divine realm a kind of godly realm, and it has something to do with us, it's connected to us, but on the other hand, it's on a different plane of existence. So we are just fundamentally different from everything that is happening out there. No, that's the realm of the gods. Here, down here, we're just basically dealing with animals and people and plants and that kind of earthbound existence. Thus the idea the conclusion that the other planets are really similar in a way to the Earth, in the sense that a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are just balls of rock. I mean, that might have struck them as being a sort of heretical thing to say. 
you're to say, well, actually, Mercury and Venus are really analogous to the Earth, because their conclusion would be, no, these things are made of a completely different substance. They're a kind of ethereal substance, not the same as the Earth, so on a different uh, level. The other thing, too, about this geocentric model is it kind of works on the basis that we're the center of existence, or at least that um, our existence is of central importance to the cosmos, meshes again with the Judeo-Christian framework that the universe as a whole is centrally concerned with human existence, and it really kind of, I would say, um, adheres to the ideals of Christianity, where Jesus is the embodiment of God walking around on the surface of the earth, but if you kind of think about it today, we know that the earth is not actually the center of the universe. There really, there is no center to the universe. It's just this vast space, and there's no actual central point. There's nothing that kind of uh, stands as the sort of linchpin of existence. The geocentric model was one of those models that was based on precedent and tradition. Again, it was not completely illogical because, as I said, they were aware of the planets being somewhat different from the other stars, although they worked from the basis that that's all divine ethereal stuff up there. Um, But nonetheless, there were issues, problems with this model. For instance, take a look at the uh, geocentric model of orbit up in the left-hand corner representation of some of the planets movements around the Earth. You have uh, Venus and Mars in there, for instance. And look at these um, kind of uh, strange, non-symmetrical looping movements. That's what they were observing. Um, And the reason they're seeing that is because they're working on the basis that these planets are revolving around the Earth. And so this is a way of kind of making their orbital patterns work and make uh, sense. Now, the reason that these orbital patterns are asymmetrical and strangely looping in this way is that the planets are not actually revolving around the Earth. This was a conclusion that Copernicus came to when he crafted his heliocentric model of the universe, which, as I say, was theorized during the uh, 1500s. This was a model just based on observation. So it wasn't necessarily him um, deciding he's going to dissent against the authorities or just uh, cooking up his own personal theory. No, observation through the use of telescopes, for instance, which were a kind of a new thing at the time. Um, Telescopes at the time would have been quite basic on the level of toy telescopes today, but they could still show you more than you could see with the naked eye. And in observing orbital patterns, Copernicus came to the conclusion that actually it makes a lot more sense to place the sun at the center of the universe. That way, the orbital patterns make a lot more sense. Look how much uh, smoother and symmetrical and concentric they appear to be. So he basically saying the Earth is actually just one of the planets that's revolving around uh, the sun. Model makes more sense, and it's just pure empirical evidence that he is uh, presenting at the time. It's also at this time of discovering things like Jupiter has moons, for instance. You need a telescope to see that, which conflicted with some of the uh, stated doctrinaire and opinions at the time. How did the religious authorities... Uh, respond to this kind of evidence to these propositions? Well, not well, as you might expect, because they were going against the accepted uh, set standards and viewpoints at the time. There you have an image of Galileo appearing in Rome in 1633 at the behest of the uh, Catholic Church, being called into the principal's office, so to speak. He was charged with heresy for supporting Copernicus's heliocentric model of the universe. So because he was supporting this alternative model, the church said, no, you're wrong, you're a heretic, you're working against religious authority. Um, famously, he actually recanted his views, even though he knew that he was right, and spent the rest of his life under house arrest. And so this was a kind of typical thing to happen at the time, new scientific ideas clashing against authorities that did not want to change their thinking, change their viewpoints. But slowly over time, it kept happening over centuries, and this is speaks to a larger shift. It's not just one person's view. If you just had some revolutionary leader like Copernicus, well then perhaps he dies and his movement withers away or at least changes dramatically. But no, this is an entire kind of way of viewing the world based again on empirical observation, just studying what's around us, extending across centuries, reaching up into the 19th century, for instance. That's the uh, 
1800s, where there were still these ongoing conflicts between religion and science at the time. 19th century geology introduced new ideas about the age of the earth that conflicted with our religious accounts. Uh, for instance, the study of sediments and rocks and stuff like that were allowing people to date the history of the earth and to come up with proposals that from the religious standpoint were really outlandish, such as the idea that the earth has been around for 4.6 billion years, right? And according to the biblical account, that's not the case. It's, what, a couple thousand years or whatever it is according to the Bible. So this is really against the grain of what the religious authorities were saying. So too, paleontology, the discovery of dinosaur fossils, for instance, that transformative idea, the notion that there were these other massive animals walking around on the planet millions of years ago, and now that they're, now they're extinct today, again, going against what the Bible was essentially telling us, not only about the age of the earth, but also about the um, uh, symbiotic growth of animals and people, story of Noah's Ark and all that stuff, right? So here you get a sense of how uh, long this extended, how long this went on over centuries. It still exists today. Debates about creationism and evolution still uh, persist on into the 21st century. It's always incredible how much you can just uh, learn by looking at the stuff that's right in front of you, such as sediment or a uh, rock. But there you have a, a hunk of rock which has a, a layer of clay embedded within it. And studies indicated that that is, in fact, a layer of iridium that's buried in uh, this rock. Why is that important? Well, because iridium is a substance, an element that is very rare on Earth but is very common in asteroids. And that allows people to come to the conclusion at the time, well, I think an asteroid hit the planet at this point and corresponded to something that happened 66 million years ago, namely the extinction of the dinosaurs. So here you see people just putting these different points together. We're not finding any dinosaur fossils past a particular moment in time, and we're also finding suddenly a lot of iridium buried in the rock put two and two together. I think this asteroid that hit the Earth had an impact on the dinosaurs, not just an impact, killed them off, basically. Think about these things, science and uh, religion. Put up that um, Dr. Fauci, who became uh, uh, famous right before his retirement, actually, as the epidemiologist in America. We live, as I said previously, in an Enlightenment society, basically a society that puts its trust in science. I would say that fundamentally on the intellectual level, that is the assumption and that holds true for whatever we're talking about, whether it's studying the origins of the planet, studying things like health and medicine, right? If you go to the hospital, the doctor, you want your doctor to take a scientific approach typically to your health, not a religious approach, right? Unless you have really that inclination and so too with just about everything else. There is this assumption, I would say, that science is the kind of um, sort of leading light of our society. That's the reason science gets all the funding, right? As opposed to the arts. But keep in mind the way that all of these ideas can be co-opted and can be treated as these kinds of brand names or these banners. And sometimes it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with scientific principles. This was true of the medieval period as well. You look at the history of religion. You look at the history of the Catholic Church. Were they always involved in religious, spiritual matters? No, they were into everything. They were involved in politics, economics. They were basically a wealthy, power-seeking institution. I mean, it just expands and, and covers all these just different areas, and religion becomes this sort of uh, banner, a superficial brand name for things. And so too is science is in uh, the modern era, especially when you look at mainstream politics and media, the use of science as just this kind of ideological principle as opposed to something that's actually real and genuine. I mentioned just Fauci as one example, who is a scientist, but nonetheless becomes the kind of personification, the embodiment of science during the um, uh, pandemic. And why? Well, because he's a counterpoint to Trump in America. I mean, that was basically the reason. Trump is speaking his conspiracy theories. Dr. Fauci is the embodiment of science. He's science, right? Let's all listen to him. He's the one who's telling us, well, science is not one person, and it's not one particular view. It's a, just a general kind of framework that encompasses so many different things. The intellectual paradigm. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, material paradigm, which, as you might expect, um, is connected to the intellectual paradigm, but we can identify it as being a, something crucially different at the same time. 
Let's say the material paradigm is a system of uh, practices and values that structure the distribution of resources, wealth, and power within society. So it has less to do with the kind of mental way we think about things, our beliefs and values, but it does touch upon those things, but it's much more the kind of uh, concrete stuff having to do with, um, say, labor. Work, for instance, the kind of work that people do, the kind of jobs that people have, um, the distribution of wealth in society, this kind of idea of who's rich and who's poor, and why are certain people so wealthy and other people so poor? Well, this touches upon a material paradigm. It's not just a random sequence of events, but it is organized according to a larger structuring framework that exists the distribution of resources. We're all aware of the existence of uh, resources, whether we're talking about natural resources for energy or how about things like food and water. We know those things are not evenly distributed across society, across different countries. We ask the question, why is that the case? Why do we see these discrepancies? Well, we can think about it in relation to a larger organizing framework, a paradigm, instead of just treating it like a kind of random, haphazard uh, thing. So that's what I mean when I talk about a uh, material uh, paradigm. Spoke previously about uh, the challenges involved in changing an intellectual paradigm, especially when you have a global intellectual paradigm. Now, the Judeo-Christian framework has never been truly global. It's basically continental European, but it aspires to be global, right? That's the idea that everyone should be brought within the ambit of the same framework. And the scientific paradigm, so too, kind of underneath it all, aspires to be a global phenomenon. Um, so when you talk on that level, then, of course, the challenges of changing can be a very very staunch, but the material paradigm perhaps even more so. I mean, when you talk about a global material paradigm, I don't think anything in the world is more difficult to change than a material paradigm because it is just completely embedded in the fundamental questions of who's rich, who's poor, what kind of work do people have, what kind of resources they do they have, what kind of jobs do they have, just touches the bedrock of people's day-to-day -day lives. And as you might expect, those who occupy the upper echelons of any given material paradigm don't want to change the system, right? They're usually perfectly fine with the way things are right now. Challenges of changing, well, uh, think about this as a case, a study. This is something we're going to talk about uh, when we get to 20th century uh, cultural history. There you see a, a late 1940s Soviet propaganda poster comparing the life of a musician under capitalism on the left and communism on uh, the right. There's all sorts of um, kind of droll propaganda posters that the Soviet Union uh, uh, produced at a, a given time. Can you consider this. The Soviet Union, which is now a defunct country, existed um, from 1917 to 1991, was a country that was committed, at least on the surface, to bringing down a material paradigm. They wanted to bring down the capitalist world order. That was according to their basic ideological principles. How committed they ever were to doing that is, of course, another question. The extent to which they actually tried to do that, okay, we can leave that open. But according to the principles of this country, that is precisely their, uh, that was precisely their goal, their objective. Now, as I say, whether they pursued it is one question, but another thing that seems perfectly clear is they never succeeded in doing it never even came close to actually toppling the capitalist framework. In fact, when you look at the situation in retrospect, it seems as though capitalism as a whole swallowed the Soviet Union completely, basically tore the country apart, transformed it into something different. Not a thing of the past, either. There you have the recent Congress for the Chinese uh, Communist Party. The Communist Party is the ruling political party of China today, which ostensibly is committed to the destruction of the capitalist system in the long run. That's their basic ideological principle, and they maintain that principle. Are they actually trying to do that right now? Well, it seems rather that that country has fully embraced capitalism, and it's basically running a market system to this day. So their principles and values are not being carried forward, and you get the impression of, well, the political leaders might have no intention of toppling capitalism, but another way of thinking about it is they can't do that. They're not capable of actually approaching it in that way. And these countries, Soviet Union, China, they're not small countries. These are superpower states. 
wealthy, powerful, with their massive militaries, and it doesn't seem that they've made much of a dent in the overarching material paradigm. So that gives you a sense of how rigid these things can actually become. Nonetheless, when we look at history, and here we're looking at kind of a deep, extensive history, we can see that there was a transition in the material paradigm that occurred over hundreds of years, basically across the medieval and renaissance period in uh, Europe, up into the 1700s and 1800s, a kind of slow, gradual, painful process, a shift in the basic organizing concrete framework that existed in uh, Europe, you could say spilling over into the world gradually as well. This was a shift, a transition from feudalism to capitalism. Feudalism, the predominant material paradigm in medieval Europe. Capitalism is the predominant material paradigm today, still definitely living in the heart of the capitalist system. Differences between them, Feudalism, those who own land hold the power. It's a basic principle of wealth and power in the feudal social order. You have to own vast uh, tracts of land. Peasants usually work to live on the land. Um, peasants are people who generally don't have freedom or any autonomy, don't own the land that they're on, often wouldn't get paid at all. They're just working for the sake of a subsistence uh, life. And social divisions are extremely rigid, which I'll get to in a moment. Capitalism, those who control the means of production hold the power. Um, and first, before I continue, you might notice some spillover between the two of them, because a shift, a transition, does not mean we dispense entirely with the feudal social order, because there are certain kind of intrinsic things in the human condition that carry forward, but we're just doing it in a kind of different way. Those who control the means of production hold the power, so not necessarily those who own all the land, but as I say, there's a connection between them. Everyone works for money. That's the story of capitalism. Money becomes the great leveling force in a capitalist material paradigm. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're panhandling on the street or whether you're the CEO of a giant corporation, you are working for money as the basic principle of what you're essentially doing. So it kind of brings people down to the same level, even though the access to money, who has a lot and who has barely any, becomes, of course, the main question in capitalism, and social divisions are somewhat looser. They're still rigid in capitalism, but there is certainly that idea of more mobility than there was under uh, feudalism. I'll look in more detail about this. The transition from feudalism to capitalism was a slow process beginning roughly in the 1400s and covering uh, hundreds of years. So as I said, not an easy thing to change. If you wanted to date it to a particular period, probably the 1400s, although many have argued that there were elements of capitalism that existed prior to that. So let's take a look at this in um, a bit more detail. Feudalism. Here you have an image from the 1400s of peasants working in uh, the shadows of a castle. As I said, the ownership of land is basically, basically commensurate with uh, wealth and power in uh, the feudal social order. And very few people actually would own land under uh, feudalism. You talk about members of the royal family, you have the king, you have some nobles as well, members of the aristocracy, like dukes and counts, people like that, members of titled family. Well, they own all the land, or basically most of it. They have vast tracts of land, they have their castles they build on the land, and they have people to work the land. But the peasants, these poor farmers, are not owners of the land that they live and work on. The peasants own very little. In fact, to a degree, the peasants are kind of owned by the people who own the land. I mean, they're kind of the property of a duke or uh, the property of uh, the royal family. So this is very much this kind of bare subsistence life for these individuals. And there you have a basic social order of, of feudalism. And I'll go through this a little bit more, but the 
thing I want to say about this prior to the break is that um, this base, this pyramid, which gives you a sense of the different levels of society, is a little bit misleading. The base should be a lot broader because the overwhelming majority of people in medieval Europe, at least 85%, in some cases well over 90%, will be peasants or serfs. So the further back you go, the more peasants or serfs you get. So this is the great majority of people at the lower rungs of society, those who occupy the upper echelons. It's a tiny, fractional number of people who basically own everything. And doesn't that sound familiar as a basic pyramid structure of human civilization and society? So talk a little bit more about this, take the break now, and come back in uh, 10 minutes.